I remember thinking, Elite Eight, Sweet 16, we got everybody back and then some, and we, we might be able to win it all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I that still- That was the feeling in the locker room. Yeah. For sure. And yeah. I feel still, still to this day, and it's been a long time, mm-hmm. feel horrible that I left. This is the Sean Miller Podcast, presented by Deer Park Roofing. Now, here's your hosts, Paul Fritchner and Adam Baum, with the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller. Welcome into another episode of the Sean Miller Podcast. Paul Fritchner, Adam Baum, the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller. And to my right, Kenny Freeze. Kenny, it's great to see you again. You played for Xavier from 2008 to 2012. You scored over 1,000 points in your career. You went to the Sweet 16 three times three in a times. Xavier uniform, an illustrious career here as a Musketeer. It is great to have you back here at the Cintas Center. Uh, we, as always, want to thank our presenting sponsor, Deer Park Roofing, as well as TGE Solar and Payroll Partners for helping make this podcast possible. But Kenny, I'd like to start off just by giving you the opportunity to tell everybody where you are right now, how life's been uh, since your playing career has ended, mm-hmm. and uh, what everything's what everything's like for you right now. Yeah, so I uh, I retired in 2019. Uh, my last year was in Switzerland, and you know basketball was just uh, started to become more of a chore than something that I love. So I knew that it was time to to end it. I was my second kid was on the way. We have, I have three kids now. Um, my with my wife Emily. And um, actually met her at Xavier. She was a Xavier volleyball player. Um, but other than that, I uh, run a home health care company back home. So just kind of growing that. We got the Roll Blob podcast that uh, we're, we're doing now. It's something that's, you know, basketball is not really a part of my life anymore. So to, to, to bring that back and have something that I can do with basketball, it's the one thing that I, you know, it's, that I truly love. And, um, you know, it's just it's been really fun to be able to come back to Xavier because I really love this place. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the other day before the game, we had an opportunity to talk and you were down there shooting on the court and I could see you kind of looking around and reminiscing and seeing a lot of those memories come flooding back, right? Yeah, it's a little weird seeing Big East on the floor, but other than that. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. Well, Kenny, I I think there's a couple of things today that I really want to talk to you about because I think so much of, of this podcast and even the reason that we're doing it is, you know, to bring up topics that may be Young people, fans, and, you know, there's all different types, I think, that follow our podcast. Maybe it's a passionate Xavier fan. You know, sometimes it's somebody that just loves the game. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I want to breach a couple topics with you here. Uh, But one of which is, you know, when when we recruited you and I was the head coach, Mm -hmm. uh, it was a really big deal. It, It was based on. You're a seven footer. You're from the state of Ohio. You were easily a top 100, top 50, top 75, whatever it shook out, player in your class, coveted and had a lot of great choices. Mm. You, you hit one thing that, that I want to talk to you about, and that is back then we had to recruit you to Xavier, but also to the Atlantic 10 Conference. Mm-hmm. It was different then, and I think you know this, like we all have great a lot of pride in the Atlantic 10 Conference, especially in those days. I mean, God, there was some great players, coaches. uh, It was was a difficult, challenging league. But we're in the Big East now. And I only say that because to be able to choose us over the choices you had in the recruiting process, that was not easy for us to do. And when we got you, I felt like you were going to open doors up for future people and players that potentially could follow the decision that you made. You almost like made it okay to come to Xavier from the state of Ohio mm-hmm. being highly ranked. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm forever grateful that you did it, and we'll get to some other parts to that. But I would just like to go back to your recruiting process, right? Back then, it was a different day and age. Yeah. And again, we're recruiting you to Xavier in the Atlantic 10 what was it and what do you think about when you think back to your choices in recruiting process? Yeah, so I went back and forth a lot of times. Um, and people ask me this question a lot, you know, what, why did you choose Xavier? And it really came down to um, Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky, Xavier, and Notre Dame. And, you know, the, 
three of those schools, Indiana, Kentucky, and Michigan, all were going through coaching changes with Samson and uh, Amaker, Tubby. They were mm-hmm. all kind of at the end of their career. They had lost lost their jobs, quit, whatever mm-hmm. it was. Um, and then really it came down to Xavier and Notre Dame and you know, everything was so equal for me. I, I'm a I'm a huge Notre Dame football fan. I have been my entire life. Um, but everything kind of just, it came back to you guys. You get the coaches, I mean, you guys were, I, I can remember my mom telling the story about how I was thinking about committing to Notre Dame and she called you and she was like, you need to, you need to talk to <laughs> <Pick> him. <it laughs> <up. laughs> and uh, so, but it was like, there was so many things that were so equal about Notre Dame and Xavier in my mind when I was being recruited. And the God's honest truth is that it came down to the fact that Xavier was a shorter drive for my family. Mm -hmm. And that's the, it's a really stupid reason, but that was the, at the end of the day, that was the one thing that was a little bit better Mm -hmm. in my mind. And then, you know, obviously I've, I had a really good relationship with you and coach Mack through the whole recruiting process. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was really the reason for all of that because it was a very personal recruiting process more so than most of the other schools yeah you know the way recruiting was then versus how it is today and even a couple years ago it's it's changed so much i think back then there was tremendous value in being a program or a head coach that was in early in your gym first Mm -hmm. making the introduction before everybody else even as as simple as who is the first scholarship offer and, you know, yeah. to be at the front of the line uh, if you're us. You know, in some ways that was our strategy. We're going to get to know Kenny and his family better than any program. We're going to allow them to get to know who we truly are. And he's not going to pick a building or the Centos Center over, over the other arena. Because sometimes, as nice as it is here, they have nice arenas as well. But at the end of the day, we're going to really get to the point where we're going to be family with family, Mm -hmm. you know, where you feel comfortable, your mom feels comfortable. And when I think back to your recruitment, from my perspective, it was like it was textbook from that and that we made you a priority. We never wavered. We showed you our undivided attention. And look, that doesn't mean we're going to get you, but I do believe that and you just said it like that one out mm-hmm. and uh and you know I, I think that's when I, for me that I would have enjoyed recruiting the most because um that's when it was really about the people the relationships time spent yeah. and you get a lot of credit for that you mm-hmm. know and yeah. uh, I think back to your family and your recruitment often when I think of how it once was yeah it's it was definitely a different time I mean I know you know everything was so much stricter with how we could be contacted and all that stuff. And like, I think about that sometimes that like, what a different era that was Mm -hmm. and just how crazy it is that, that that was even a thing because Mm -hmm. now it's just, you know, I don't know what the recruiting process is like now. Obviously I've been out of it for a long time, but to, to see the contrast between then and now is pretty crazy. The Sean Miller Podcast is proud to partner with Deer Park Roofing, a company that's provided elite service for homes and businesses since 1996 and leads the industry in professionalism, quality, and responsiveness. Whether your needs are residential or commercial, like the outstanding work on the Cintas Center, the home of Xavier Basketball, Deer Park can handle any job and ensure it's done right. Deer Park's motto is protect what's important, and what's important to you is important to Deer Park Roofing. Visit DeerParkRoofing.com. When you look back at your career here at Xavier and the decisions that you made, and I think talking about being a Notre Dame fan, I mean, we can go through your (laughs) career, but to have your career culminate in the way it did in the NCAA tournament in beating (laughs) Notre Dame in the first round of the tournament in that game, then eventually going to the Sweet 16, you beat Lehigh in the next game. Uh, but, But before we get into everything in the beginning of your career, I think it's good to start there, maybe, and, and work yeah. backwards, given the fact you just talked about Notre Dame. What, well, was it, what was that for you? What was that like? You know, I mean, the season, that season obviously was in turmoil from, I don't even know what it was, game eight, whatever. We had yeah. all the suspensions, and we were kind that, of That was the downfall. shootout brawl. Yeah. Year, right? and, yep. Yeah, and I think at one point we lost to, like, the, I don't know, it was a 300-plus ranked team. Yep. But... To take that game it, against Notre Dame, 
nobody was really looking at us like we were going to win because the season was so, it was just so up and down to be able to, and then we came back against them too, which nobody comes back against Notre Dame. They, they really controlled the game, made sure that there was no high scoring, all that stuff. So we came back, beat them, and then, you know, I got to play against CJ McCollum at Lehigh, and we grew up five minutes from each other. So it was cool to have, to have that experience as well. And then, you know, obviously we go to play Baylor in the Georgia Dome and, um, that that game was kind of the same you know we the game started off terrible and then we made a run at the end almost had it we had a chance to win I think we ended up losing by like six or seven something like that but obviously two and cheeks played great they were just you know those were those guys were always the guys that we knew we could count on to make sure that they were going to keep us in games too especially I mean he was just you never you always felt confident walking on the floor with two Holloway and so like I didn't care who we were playing I, I felt like we had a chance to win yeah yeah and I think one of the things that I was illuminated by in preparing for this was just what a great career you had. I think you won 100 games in mm -hmm. a Xavier uniform, four NCAA tournament appearances, three Sweet, sweet 16s, and you just touched on it previously, but it's certainly not fair. But I am wondering, like, what does it feel like that a lot of people remember you for this this moment that really was not you did nothing wrong and it's like it's this thing that that is yeah. follow it's followed you yeah i think i think that people outside of xavier remember me for that and then there's people at xavier that probably remember me for some some other things that maybe aren't great <laughs> <laughs> but uh you know it's i definitely still when i come back here i still feel that like you know people have a respect for the time that, that not just for me, but for the time that I had here uh, with yeah. all the, our whole group of guys. So, and that's why I love like coming back and last night or two nights ago coming to the game. And um, it's just great. The, the interactions with the fans, I got to see Amy and all that. Mm -hmm. That was awesome. She came up and said hi to me. And then at one point <laughs> she looked at me and she was like, can you let these guys know they're on their home court? <laughs> <laughs> but it was, but uh, yeah, it was, it's just awesome coming back here. There's so m I have so many memories, you know, just in the locker room, so different. Everything's so different. Every, mm -hmm. every, the, from the court to the behind the scenes, the weight room, training room, all that stuff, it's so different. But when I walk, like that's the way I was, when I, when it, the way it was when I was here is still the way that I remember it. And so mm -hmm. when I see it now, it's, it kind of feels like weird, but obviously it's much better. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. for me, it'll never be better than the locker room we had, the weight yeah, room we had. For sure. So. Yeah. So um, I think a really big topic in college sports is transferring and also the impact it has when a coach leaves. Yeah. You know, so I'm going to talk about leaving here and, you know, the emotions of it. And, and so we go back to our the recruiting process. You know, at that point, um, I would have been the head coach at Xavier for three years. So when you were a senior in high school, we were in our fourth year, and you could see that we were building mm -hmm. and really becoming something special. We had a great group. Yeah. Your senior year of high school, we went to the Elite Eight and mm -hmm. lost to uh, Russell Westbrook and Kevin Love and that UCLA team. Yep. You know, of all the teams that I've coached, you know, that might be, <clears throat> if not my favorite, certainly one of them, not just because of how far we got fact we won 30 games but we had a style you know we had a point guard drew lavender yeah. that was five foot eight we could score we could play defense we had a lot of guys that grew up in our program that were older but we had your recruiting class coming in right behind them and sure enough we went from an elite eight where i think a lot of people thought hey they had their one moment let's see if they can someday get back to this level again right. and we did it the next year mm -hmm. That first year, your freshman year, we were in the Sweet 16 playing Pitt, who was a one seed. Yeah. I'm sure you remember the game. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was the one time after a season here at Xavier that when it all ended, I, I didn't feel good. Yeah. Simply because I looked around and felt like we should have won. Yeah. You know, that we, we had actually more in the tank. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the greatest testament towards developing a program that you could really talk about. Yeah. And I feel like you guys felt the same way. And you were a freshman, oh, right? Yeah. And two Holloway was a freshman. And the tone was really set for, okay, you guys went to an Elite Eight. You have these young guys blending in now. 
you came back, went to a Sweet 16, and you got uh, these two guys that are sitting out. One guy, Jordan Crawford, another guy, Mark Lyons. Yeah. Uh, Derek Brown could could have come back for his last year. Uh, you and two are now going to be sophomores, and Brad Redford. We had a great group, and uh, I remember thinking, Elite Eight, Sweet 16, we got everybody back and then some, and we, we might be able to win it all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I that still... That was the feeling in the locker room. Yeah. For sure. And yeah. I feel still, still to this day, and it's been a long time, mm-hmm. feel horrible that I left. And, you know, that is what it is. And, and, but I'll tell you, it was really difficult because uh, a couple of things. I knew what a special group of guys... That, that we had returning. I also knew that people like yourself believed in me and, and us, and you had great choices. You didn't have to come to Xavier. And, you know, you have this really tough feeling that, God, I, I, I wish this could be easier. Uh, should you go? Should you stay? It's not, it's not an easy feeling for anybody. But so I want to take you back to that because I know your mom's still mad at me to this day, and rightfully so. Uh, I, I avoided her for a long time yeah. because I thought I, I thought she may bring me down if, oh, if yeah. I saw her. My mom will get you. <laughs> she might yeah. have fought me. Uh, she was so angry yeah. at me. Understood. Uh, but no, I love her. And uh, but I, I want to just kind of, from your perspective, what is it like, you know, when that happens, and just the feelings? Because I, I think that's a topic that a lot of people think they know about, but until you really went through it, yeah. um, you don't. Yeah, I mean, I st- I mean, I can still vividly remember you sitting on that stool in the locker room. You, I mean, you know, the, you were you were sweating pretty bad. You had the, <laughs> you had the towel it. over you, <laughs> and you came walking in the locker room. And, you know, I think from all of our perspectives, we all saw how difficult it was. So I don't think that – I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I've never – I've never had any ill will towards that decision right? because it's, I learned very early that basketball is a business mm. and until you, until you embrace that mindset, right? you're never, you're, you're going to face a lot of disappointment mm-hmm. and in a lot of, and I mean, every single level after you leave high school, uh, college professionally, whatever it is, if you don't accept that part of it. So I, I never, once felt any type of anger towards you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really think that it was the recruiting process and everything. I know that, like I said before, it was very personal, but it was, it was about the program. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, right after it happened, my immediate thought was, I'm going to try and go to Arizona. I'm going to, I'm going to leave. I'm going to, I want to at least look at my options, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I didn't want to sit out. And there was no way to get around that. Yeah, that's that. right. No, and it's different. It's, yeah. it's different, so, yeah. That was, uh, but it worked out yeah. for you, most importantly. Yeah, I mean, it worked out. And it's, you know, me and, me and Coach Mack always had a head-butting relationship. Um, I, I have immense respect for him. and mm-hmm. he, I mean, he's a great coach. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things where I – and I look back on it as being a young kid, and I know that I was being stupid. Mm-hmm. You know, I was doing things that I shouldn't have done, and I was, you know, pushing him in ways that I probably shouldn't have. But when you're 19, 20 years old and, you know, I got recruited the way that I did. We had been to Sweet 16. You know, mm-hmm. you got and got the red carpet rolled out at your feet, and mm-hmm. you feel like you're a bigger deal than you actually are. Um, that's something that I had to learn the hard way, I think, uh, later in life. But – I just I, that whole that whole process was just a whirlwind, and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden practice is starting, and it's like mm-hmm. you got to just got to forget about it, and yeah. that's that's where I was. I can remember, uh, and we've already talked about this on the podcast, just watching you guys that next year. That would have been my first year away, and we weren't good. Uh, we we were just very beginning stages of rebuilding Arizona. And I remember looking and watching you guys play Kansas State mm. and being like, "These, I think they're going to the Final Four. Yeah. Uh, and if you would have won that game, you would have played Butler mm-hmm. to go to the Final Four. Mm-hmm. And obviously Butler, looking what we know now, they were really, really good. Yeah. But the Xavier Butler 
you know, rivalry, if you if you mm-hmm. call it that, uh, two, two programs at that point that didn't share a conference that were just a drive away, that would have yeah. been interesting to see, you know, who would have gotten to their first Final Four right yeah. there. So, right. Yeah. But, yeah, that was a, that was a surreal moment I for me, I think if too. anybody was equipped to beat Butler that year, it would have been us. Because mm-hmm. we had, uh, just because they were obviously really talented with Gordon and Matt Howard, all those guys, but... Just with the way that the game, with the way the game ended at their place, how'd that game end, Kenny? <laughs> uh, so let me fast. Let me rewind. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so the first time that that Butler Xavier uh, game was played, Brad Stevens being the coach, yeah. and um, we played him here at Centos. That would have been Kenny's freshman year, mm-hmm. yep. and that would have been my last year. Uh, here the first time around i remember and we were good obviously we got to the sweet 16 and almost won 30 games they they were understated Mm -hmm. you know uh gordon hayward was playing matt howard um and shelvin mack nobody the world of college basketball didn't truly know who they were quite frankly they didn't know who brad stevens was at that point right but i'll never forget this one of the rare times coming off the court at halftime that I heard a resounding level of boos from the Centos crowd. Because of Matt Howard. We, we, he had like 100 offensive rebounds. Yeah, we were down. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we were down probably double digits. Yeah. And right, Matt Howard, this guy didn't look to part, right? Floppy red hair just in there. Nobody could block him out. They were running us around, but we were down double digits, and it looked like we weren't trying. I would beg to differ. We were. Right. They were just really good. Yeah. But I remember getting to the locker room and, and telling you guys, you probably remember it. They're booing you. Mm-hmm. They're booing us. They're booing. We're all in this together. They should be booing us, right? Mm-hmm. You're letting these guys and no one goes. And I never, I looked at Derek Brown. I said, Gordon Hayward. I don't even know. Who, where's he from? Like, who is this guy? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're making him look like an NBA first round pick, Derek Brown. Like, what, what, what's up? Are you going to try? Are you going to try the second half? I mean, whoa. And uh, Derek and I have actually talked about it many times. He remembers, like, Gordon Hayward, he's pretty good. (laughs) He was pretty good. (laughs) But uh, they came out, they beat us. Mm -hmm. And they beat us really from start to finish in that game. So I left, and I was at Arizona, and I knew that the return game was at Butler. So go ahead. Well, just real quick, one of the things that sticks out in my mind about that game is that Matt Howard got his own rebound when he was shooting free throws twice in that game. Yeah. And I, I remember it like it was yesterday because of just the, the film session after the game was. <laughs> I mean, because we used to have to run up downs if we didn't, for every time we didn't block out, all that stuff. And that day it was like for a half hour after practice, everybody's got like 50 up downs. Like there was, it was nuts. <laughs> but um, no, so, this, so the second game happens and, you know, we, it gets down to the very end. I remember diving on the, diving on the floor and grabbing a ball. And ball slipped out of my hand, so, something. I can't remember exactly what happened, but Gordon gets the, gets the ball and lays it up. And, and then all, the stu- all of a sudden, they're going to the monitor. And it's like, well, there's 3.8 seconds left. And we're like, okay, well, so obviously we're going to get 3.8 seconds. The refs go stare at the monitor. and they're just, I mean, it's, it seemed like 20 minutes they were looking at it. And all of a sudden, comes out, the guy says, game over, and just runs off the court. And we're like, what, what do you mean? He was like, well, it was exactly 3.8 seconds that they had stopped the clock. So we're just taking the rest of the time off. Game over. The ref just ran off the floor, and we're like, I mean, two standing in the at half court with it, took his jersey off. He's just like running around. I, I, I mean, it was <laughs> just madness in the whole place. And then, you know, I, I went through and we'll stop right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's good. That's There's good. more to that story. Your yeah. hydration levels we'll took a hit after we'll the game. It. Yeah, we'll, I'm sure that story will come out somewhere, but <laughs> it's 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 not like people don't know about it. <laughs> no, it was that was. I'll never forget the look. I felt so, I mean, I feel bad now. At the time, I didn't feel bad at all. Um, But just, like, I can still see the managers from Butler, like, plugging up the hole on the wall with, like, (laughs) towels and and Mario. And I mean, you know Mario is just the way he talks. He's just, uh, I can't swear on here, but the way that Mario talks, he's just like, Jesus, guys. And, uh, (laughs) but that was, uh, what a, what a crazy game. Stop renting your power, own it. 
TGE Solar makes it easy to purchase solar panels for your home or business so you can take control of your monthly electricity bill and start saving today. They'll help you find the best solar system to meet your needs, and their expert in-house installation team makes the process seamless. They're proud to be based in Cincinnati, family-owned and operated by a Xavier alum. Mention this podcast and save $1,000. Visit TGESolar.com to request your free energy evaluation today. Welcome back here to the Sean Miller Podcast. Um, having fun talking to, to Kenny Freeze and all about his career. But I, I wanted to ask you, Coach, you talk about the decision to leave Xavier. And then, you know, you spend all this time recruiting these guys, coaching them, and then you're gone. And what's that like to watch their career unfold from afar? Like, do you, do you stay in touch with them? Do you make it a priority to, to follow what's going on with them? You know, the way, I think the way you stay in touch with them is just to have a good pulse on how they're doing. Uh, back then, you know, it's difficult when you're no longer their coach to continue to talk. Uh, there's just, uh, I think, a healthy separation where they they now have to move forward with the, the new coach. And in that case, for me, obviously I was pulling for and cheering on Xavier because I love Xavier, but also Chris Mack was the coach and the staff, knew everybody on the staff, knew everybody on the team, certainly knew and loved this place. Uh, like we talked about, it was difficult to leave Xavier uh, and watch these guys because I knew ahead of time that they were going to be really good. But to watch the success afterwards, um, you hear this sometimes in coaching, Adam, that you know, when you really look at yourself as a coach or you start to think back of impact or how did you do um, and you think about your time spent at that one place, I think part of that should also encompass what was it like right when you left? Was it healthy? Did they have a good year, a good couple of years? And I've always had the peace of mind, and that's part of what kept me going is that when, when I left, um, they went on to do just amazing things. I mean, you talk about Kenny. He played in one Sweet 16 his freshman year when I was the head coach, but he went to four NCAA tournaments and played in three Sweet 16s. So this program was off and running. Obviously, Chris did an amazing job, and I think it was set up for, for a lot of success. So I think you have pride in that when you're no longer there to see those that you, you are working with and that you are together with go on and do great things without you. So I, I was cheering for them and hoping that they would, they would beat Kansas State. And, and uh, I was fully aware of the Butler, you know, two yeah. games there. And that would have been an interesting, think about it, an interesting third matchup to go to the Final Four. And, and that's what captivates college basketball. Like Kenny, you could tell he loves college basketball. Trust me, part of his love for this game is how much the NCAA tournament means to players the experiences, the wins, the highs of the wins, and that just incredible crushing feeling when you lose and it's all over. And that was another thing that I wanted to talk to you about, Kenny. You know, the experience of playing in four NCAA tournaments, getting to the, the second weekend, Sweet right. 16 level, three times. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think of that, I mean, you're going to – I always feel this way. When you do it, it's a forever moment. You have it forever. Like right. last year – when we got to the Sweet 16, I would tell like Nunji and Kunkel and Sule Boom, this is something you'll remember forever. Yeah. You'll, you'll never have to be reminded who you beat, where you were. And I would just put, give that to you. What are your feelings about your time in the NCAA tournament? There's just, uh, it's like a different feeling in the air when you walk into an NCAA tournament game. You see that blue and it's just, you, you walk on the court and they have you play with those Wilson basketballs. I don't know if they still do that yeah. or not, but and you know, I used to love the. A lot of people hated the Wilson basketball, but I, I loved it. It was really grippy. It was good, but um, I just remember what, you walk into that gym and it's just a you know for the most part not your fans because your your game's coming up next and they're going to start filing in and depending on where the game is, uh, how many people are actually going to be there, but just the feeling of you wake up in the morning and you watch basketball all day, and then you go through and you do your walkthrough and all that stuff. You go to the game, you play, you win, and all of a sudden there's only 32 teams left playing. Right. You know, And then you play again, and all of a sudden there's only 16 teams left. And when you get to the Sweet 16 like we did, it was like a wall that we just couldn't break through. But you get the feeling like once you've made it there that you can make it to the end. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, 
that was always the feeling for me was just like that. There's no better. I mean, I, I, we were just talking about it the other day that like the NFL is the greatest product, I think, yeah. sports wise. But as just an individual event, I don't think there's anything better than the NCAA tournament in all of sports. Mm-hmm. It's just it's. And I mean, <clears throat> I don't want to cheapen it at all by saying like the way that basketball, college basketball was when I played was so like you had your group of guys and you had to make it work with that group of guys. Right. And like, you know, it's, it's one of the hardest things to do is to bring together a team. And and like, we talk about it all the time on our podcast about what you've had to go through this year, putting together 10 guys that have never played together before and how difficult that Mm -hmm. is. And, you know, the NCAA tournament just, it's just the thing that you can show that made your work. How about the police escort? Yeah, right. The police escort is like, and you know that, that you feel like the president, man. You're just you're rolling through like Atlanta in the in rush hour, and you're just flying any player down the street. that I've coached that's been in the, the tournament and usually takes a Sweet Sixteen appearance before you really have that police escort. Yeah. But when you have it, that's when it's you're different. like, wow, this is really serious. Yeah, and I mean, there's cameras on you everywhere you go. It's just, uh, oh. Man. Yeah, it's awesome. If I had, if I had a chance, if, that would be the one thing I would want to do again if I could is right. play in the NCAA tournament. That's just like, there's nothing like it. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you, and it's, it's obviously the, you know, the thing that I think we all love about the game. Yeah. Well, and especially for you, Kenny, and the games that you played in, and you look back at the Kansas State game, right. and that's a game that I think every Xavier fan that is listening to this podcast would think is one of the most memorable games that sticks out. And I know it didn't turn out. Right. The way that you right. would hope it would, it turned into a double overtime loss. Right. But with Gus Johnson being on the call yeah. of that game and what Jordan Crawford was doing to Holloway stepping up and hitting three free throws at, at the most crucial moment of the game. So many memorable moments there from that one that, again, I know it resulted in a loss. Right. But does that game stick out in your mind as much as it sticks out in everybody else's mind? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, just briefly uh, about the game when those guys were shooting those shots to go to the free throw line like I wasn't even nervous Jordan pulls up from 10 yeah. feet behind the three point line I was like that's gonna that's going I've watched him I played open gym with him all summer mm-hmm. I watched what he did to Dez that you know mm-hmm. Dez Wells when he he mm-hmm. would walk over half court and be like when have you seen this before and he would just <laughs> pull up from a foot in front of half court and we're all like yeah Dez you gotta guard him right you know and just that kind of stuff was it was just guaranteed. I knew I knew it was going to go in. The game, like you said, the game didn't end the way that we wanted it to, but it was just an incredible game to be a part of. And talk about the right person at the right time. Gus Johnson being on that game was it could, you couldn't ask for a better. Maybe yeah. John Fanta. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't need to feed Fanta. Yeah, no, his, his ego's too big. His ego's too big. We may have to cut the, this part. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. It was that. That's all the games though. The pit game. I mean, I remember Coach. Uh, Man, Coach Whitford, I think, he he was like, he's going to come down, he's going to take two dribbles, he's going to go between his legs, and he's going to pull up and shoot it. And it's exactly what he did. Yeah. Makes a shot, you know, Derek Brown's heel touches the ground, and, it, you know, they get the ball back. But that that pit game in particular, I remember you guys hyped up, not that he wasn't a good player by any means, and is a good player, but Dwan Blair, you guys, yeah. were, you know, you, you guys were looking at me like, this is your time to come out and show people mm-hmm. what you are, blah, blah, blah. You're just a freshman. You got to come out. I think I had like six blocks in the mm-hmm. first half. And that game, I just love being a, being a part of, you know, almost winning that game, yeah. putting ourselves in a position to win the game, just having so that feeling. do you remember who we would have played if we won? And, and again, Pitt. Pitt in that year was the one seed. Yeah. They might have been the number one overall seed in the tournament, really and good. I think they would say the same thing on their end. That game could have gone either way ten different times. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're right. Derek stepped on the line. To this day, I'm still wondering why. Uh, it, it was almost like a he ran a loose ball down with nobody around, and yeah. all of a sudden, uh, it just it just happened. Yeah. Uh, but again, back to the tournament. Those are the little things that a lot of people are like. How do you remember that? You can't forget no, it. Yeah. But if we would have won, we would have played Villanova. And at that point, Jay Wright was the head coach. They had not gone to a Final Four yet. So that was, I think, Scotty Reynolds. Scotty Reynolds, those guys. Yep. 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 We would have played them in uh, the Boston Garden Yeah. to go to uh, to the Final Four. You know, I think it's a testament to to you, really, that I didn't know who we were playing next because you guys really, <laughs> you guys really focused on that one game at a time. Yeah. You know, we had our – we always talked about, like, the – like 14, 14 tournament. tournament. Yeah. Yep. 
And but we just it was just about that one game in front of you, one foot in front of the other, get it going. We like, still do that, and I think it's a great way of looking at the tournament. You know, Coach K could have been his model. I've heard him talk about it before, but I know it's always worked for us. And that you know, it takes away the the huge mountain of God. There's there's so much going on, and yeah. you know how how do you get to a national championship and Final Four, and you know you just you just say nope. It's about one thing. Well, this is the Greensboro tournament. Yeah. And if 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 we win the first game or the winner of the first game between us and Kennesaw State is going to play the winner of Iowa State in Pitt. That was our bracket last year. Nothing right. else matters. Yep. And the reason is that if you don't win the first game, you don't play the winner of Pitt in Iowa State. And if you don't win the second game, you don't leave Greensboro, and there is no next region. But right, right. now, our focus is on these this 14 tournament and this first game. Yeah. And it really has, does a great way of just drilling down something that's just so big and massive and really allowing, I think, a group of people to focus on the task at hand. Today's practice, you know, today's media session, our scouting, being the most ready we can be for the jump ball. Yeah, I think especially especially for young guys. Mm -hmm. I know for me as a freshman, it really helped. It helped me to shrink it down to something that I could handle. Because, mm -hmm. I, I mean, those games are they're so nerve-wracking. I think we played, we beat Wisconsin the first round. Yeah. And... and I remember going to the free, I was just, I may have been talking to Adam about it a couple nights ago. There was, I went up to shoot my free throws for the first time in that game and I felt like I couldn't control my hands. <laughs> like I, I went up, banked the free throw in and I started laughing and DJ looks at me and he's like, what the f are you laughing about? <laughs> and then the next, the next one just barely touched the front of the rim because I over, I overcorrected. Yeah. But, you know, but those games, people will never understand until you're in that moment how nerve wracking the game can be and being able to, boil it down to we got this game in front of us stop looking ahead it's a four-team tournament like that was really helpful for me as a freshman especially so I, I would also tell you this Kenny like when you look at the tournament in today's world 2023 24 and beyond you know keep a couple things in mind that when you see that really young talented team in some ways the anxiety in what you just described regardless of I mean these are really talented players. That anxiety is still really prevalent with them if they've never been in a tournament mm -hmm. before. Yeah. And I think when you talk about parity and upsets in a tournament, that's why the seeds to some degree aren't as meaningful today as they once were because, you know, you play a veteran-laden team, seniors, juniors, guys that have been in the tournament multiple times. How about this? Guys that have advanced in the tournament multiple times – they don't see the NCAA tournament nearly the same way as that person that's never been in it before. Mm -hmm. That hurt our team a little bit last year. You know, although we had a group of older guys and a very talented roster, the climb to actually making the tournament was so big, and now you're in it, yeah. and now you're reminded, like, oh, man, you, you mean to tell me we could be out of this thing in two hours? <laughs> yep, you, yeah. you can. So the next phase is to be ready, and that anxiety has to leave you, and mm -hmm. you have to do what you do. Yep. You know, and be the team, and I think the player that you're 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 capable of being. Not as easy for that first year player. No, not at all. I mean, I, I mean, it's it's easier for some guys than others. Yeah. You know, like I think two step into that his first game. I mean, yeah. two's just always been the ultimate pro. You know, yeah. he's he was the way that he prepared for everything. He he didn't ever have any reason to be nervous about anything and he never was. Yeah. And so I think it's different for some players, but you're exactly right. I know for me and I'm sure for Brad it was it was like that and Brian Walsh too. Um but it's just it's rough. that's a tough first game. I'll tell yeah. you that much for sure. <laughs>
Kenny, you mentioned how Sean would do a job of making sure you're only focused on the mm-hmm. game at hand. And, and Sean, I asked you about that in the post-game press conference uh, the other mm-hmm. night after the Georgetown game where I said, look, you have a big week coming up this week where you go to Creighton, you go to UConn. And your answer was, well, Paul, they're all big weeks. You're in the Big East. Every game's a war. Yep. You can't take one week separated from another week just because of the name on the front of the jersey. Yep. And now playing here in the Big East versus, you know, Kenny playing back in, in the A-10 and yep. the five straight A-10 championships and now seeing where this program is here in the Big East, not necessarily to take away from the A-10, but more so to see where Xavier is at this point yep. and, and the job that Sean is doing here with focusing each player in this group on one game next to the mm-hmm. next. How important was that for you and, and focusing one game at a time? I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Coach Miller, every single time we would walk into the locker room, he would say, he said, it's a big game. Yeah, it's a big game because we're playing in it. <laughs> you know, like, it, like that, was, that was always the mindset. But there was, I mean, the A-10 was, was what it was. Our non-conference schedule when we played in the A-10 mm-hmm. was grueling. I mean, we had rough we had rough i mean our strength of schedule at non-conference was always you know top 10 we we were those games that we played were crazy and then you go into the a10 and it was like you're just trying not to let one of those guys knock you off because you always you get you went into every game the favorite i mean except for maybe like some temple games maybe umass uh st louis had some good teams but you you figure you probably went into 90 percent of those games the favorite so you had to play with that mentality of like you're gonna have to take their best shot Yep. And, you know, in the Big East now, it's a little bit different because every team's just really good. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe not every team, but most of them are really yep. good. And they have they have the crowds to back it up. They have the – obviously, they have the recruiting in the Big East. They're still getting really good players that can go off at any moment. And so I think that that's the biggest difference between the Big East and the, and the A-10 is just top to bottom, the teams are better. Yeah. So. You know, um, when I watch coaches and just different teams – I, I love the NFL. Mm-hmm. You, you mentioned it as well. You know, you're from the Northeast Ohio. I'm from Western Pennsylvania. If you grow up there without us even realizing it, they they wire you to yeah. love the NFL, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's all we have to some degree. Mm-hmm. That in the two months of of summer that, that we enjoy, <laughs> and, and the rest uh, being the rain and winter, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, NFL. But you think about this past weekend, and just you know, you watch the Ravens versus the Texans, and then. You follow that up with Green Bay and San Francisco and just parody. Mm-hmm. It's what captivates you as a fan in the NFL. It's yeah. like there's only a couple teams that are out of it. Everybody else, not only are they in it, but once the playoffs begin, it almost seems like, man, the separation is a turnover, right, an injury yeah. between one team and the next. Um, the Big East Conference in basketball – right now is like that. Yeah. This past weekend, I mean, you have games, a triple overtime game between Seton Hall and Creighton. Amazing game. Yeah. You know, watching Marquette at the Garden playing St. John's. You know, amazing game. You know, our game home here against Georgetown the day earlier, 92-91. Just, so what separates the wins and the losses or the seventh place team from the third place team? They're single moments, and, yeah. and it's can can we be the best we can be and the most prepared? Like today, for example, we have that day off. We're in game mode, playing a lot of games, yeah. and then we have two practices before we have a game. How will these two practices go? In large part, it defines who we will be when we play our next game, and for us it happens to be at Creighton. Yeah. And you know, I think you know that that process of a player – you know, that's that grind yeah. that only you really know if you've been through it. Mm-hmm. That these two days are difficult. End of January, you're used to playing games, mm-hmm. and you just know that that practice is going to be practice. Yeah, and for sure. The, the, the practices in between the games in this part of the season, it starts to just – it starts to feel really monotonous. Right. And – I remember the way that you, you used to count practices. I don't know if you still do yeah. that or not, but I just remember being like, man, when am I going to stop thinking about what number practice this is? Because it would be like, <laughs> we're just, now we're at two, three, and it was usually around like 15, 16, where it was just like, all right, now we're in the flow of the season. I'm not thinking about what's what number <laughs> practice this is anymore or whatever. Because, you know, you, I mean, how many practices do you have in a year? No, it, it's, it's, it's really between about 
95 and 110 or 105, right. give or take. Yeah. And when you start that first practice, you're like, man, I got 95 of these things. <laughs> so, yeah, for, as a coach, is the same. Like, we're at about 70 right now, so yeah. you use the term monotonous. Yeah. yeah. It can be that. And so, you know, as a coach, what you start to think about is, how can I be out there less? You know, can I, how can I shorten it? And if I do, what do I give up? Can my guys stay mentally and physically fresh and sharp? By us doing less, and then you know they, I know it doesn't feel like they shrunk, but they did. Oh no, I, they def, <laughs> no, they definitely did because we used to. I mean, our our practices in the beginning were every bit of three hours, mm -hmm. and then by the end of the year we were going hour and fifteen, hour and a half. Yeah. I, I definitely felt the shrinking of the practice for sure, but um, I think that a lot of that comes with the guys that you have, the, what the leaders that you have, and things right. like that. Like we never, we never really had a problem with any of that because of the guys that were on the court. I feel like we were able to stay focused in a way because of all of the experience that we had, especially in my senior year. I mean, we right. had we had four or five guys that had been to three tournaments already at that yeah. point and like and so we knew what, what we needed to ha what we needed to do to get the job done and I guess it would just depend on the team whether or not you got to keep those practices long or not. So yeah, and, just, and you you really what you talked about without realizing is just People use the term culture. Yeah. You just almost described it from a player's perspective. Yeah. It's, this is what it is. This is how we do it. No one has to explain to me why, because mm -hmm. we're trying to win. Yeah. These are our goals, and we know that in order to get there, this is the process we have to follow, and I'm here to help everybody get there. You yeah. know, it's just, and, and that's really what was here for so long. Uh, just... T talking about culture, I know it has a lot more to do with the X's and O's and stuff, but the one thing that I really missed when I started playing basketball overseas was every coach has a different philosophy or, the, or like how they want to play defense, if they're going to change their defenses for different teams or how they're going to do it. And that was always so frustrating to me because from probably about two or three months of my time at Xavier, I knew defensively what I was going to be doing in every in every position, mm -hmm. and under any circumstance, what it, what I needed to do, and I was able to just do that for four years, and yeah. I knew that I was going to be fine. But that was the biggest thing for me was just having those having rules and having that stuff mm -hmm. that's set in place, and you know throwing it, throwing the fastball and not having to worry about the curveball too much. You know yep. that was our way, that's the way we did things. We made yep. sure we we made people we imposed our will on people. And I just, that, that was something that I really appreciated about Xavier looking back that I didn't ever get as a professional because it mm -hmm. was just, it's just not the way they did things, so. Kenny, I don't know if you remember this, but we rewind the clock a little bit. Um, Sean gets rehired here at Xavier, mm -hmm. and that was on a Saturday night. I'll never forget it. Early that next week, I was still at the Enquirer. I was still writing Xavier stories. And, you know, I think I had met Sean once in Maui, and we talked about, I don't even remember. But, you know, I wanted to write a story about who is this guy as a mm -hmm. coach. And I thought the best thing that I could do is talk to the guys who played for him. So I called you, I called CJ Anderson, I called Justin Dolman, I and I called uh, Derek Brown. Mm -hmm. And the title of that story was, um, run through a brick wall yeah you guys all told me the same thing and i i think maybe you know it, it might be a good opportunity to to highlight why that was the case with sean it's hard i mean it's, it's hard to really put a finger on why exactly but i mean when you come into the program it's like you're just a 18 19 year old kid and you've just, you know, you got your scholarship and everything, and then all of a sudden you get there and you realize, oh, hey, like now, now it's time to do it. You know, you actually have to play and, you know, do that stuff, and which obviously is the reason you're here, but, you know, the coaches are really nice and stuff when they're recruiting you, you know? <laughs> and then they get here and you're like, okay, now I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm low man on the totem pole and I gotta work my way up. And, um, but just that feeling of knowing that what he was doing was making us as a team better, making me better, um, that was the reason why I always felt like he, I always felt like he had my back no matter what. So that was the reason why it was, that's why it was so easy when he came back to just kind of bring myself back and become a part of the, a, a part of the fan base again. And not to say that I wasn't with 
Coach Mack and Coach Steele, but I just never felt as home as much as when Coach Miller was here. So I appreciate that, Kenny. Kenny, before we wrap up this show here, I know you watch every game. Oh, yeah. You're you're very involved. You're uh-huh. you're active uh, on Twitter, or I guess <laughs> X as it's called now. Yeah. Um, so I'd just like to hear your thoughts on this year's team. Yeah, I mean, I think that we've been talking about it, me and Coop and Cap. We've been talking about it a lot on the podcast. Just the way that the team has had to come together because of, you know, just a bunch of new guys. And I think that anybody that saw this team on paper would have said in the beginning of the year, it's going to take them some time to fall into roles. And really, the way that the the way that the guys, the scorers on the team have been playing the last few games, that four, that core group of four guys, you can tell that the way that they're scoring the ball now is a way that makes the team better rather than forcing things to try and make to try and get their numbers, get shots up, whatever it is. And I think that you can tell a big difference in that just as a a casual fan or somebody like me that watches the game and gets angry like I'm sure coach does because I know what the rules are. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I don't know how much they've changed since I was here, but I ha- would have to imagine not not too too much because I I see a lot of the same things, but um I think that that's the biggest thing is these guys fall, falling into those roles. Gidis and Abu really being the tough guys down low that are, you know, imposing their will, like like I said before. And then you have, I mean, obviously Quincy's going to be Quincy. And then if you're able to get able to get Trey going off a game or whatever it is, McKnight and, you know, Dez, obviously, I mean, that, he kind of, he I kind of overlooked Dez because he's just like, that's the guy, you know. And I think a lot of the, in the beginning of the season, Dez had so much thrown on him in a way that most Xavier players don't because there's right. we usually yeah. have that culture mm-hmm. of guys that, are, yep. that have moved up. And so I think that you're starting to see him come into his own too. He's not forcing up threes. He's getting to that getting to that floater or pull-up game that he likes and getting to the basket. So I think just watching those guys progress and find the way that they can make the team better just over the games and practices and everything, I think that's been the biggest thing. You know, the other thing, Kenny, that this group this year has in common with you is – the tough non-conference schedule. Mm -hmm. You know, the record sometimes can be deceiving at this time of year, both ways. Sometimes it can be really inflated and it's gonna take the next six weeks for everybody to finally see that the reason that November went so well is because of who they were playing, not them. Yeah. I think our group, look, we've taken on everybody almost too much. And uh, at times what you worry about is you can lose your confidence. And I think for us, we've gotten through that period of time. It's not going to be any easier. You know, we talked about our next two games. But I do think we're more sure of ourselves now than than we've ever been. And, you know, listening to you talk, one thing that resounding for me, uh, theme listening to you is, the value of experience. Mm-hmm. Watching young people learn from those that are there before. You talked about BJ. He would yeah. have been a senior when you were a freshman. Right. And, and you freshman experience, how you felt at the free throw line in your first NCAA tournament game. And then to fast forward and hear you talk about how confident you were getting ready to play Kansas State, that if you played Butler, that you felt you could win it. And mm-hmm. now that's the end. You know, yeah. so you almost right. go through, you know, that that whole cycle. But, you know, to be on a team with somebody that had played in three Sweet 16s or, you know, he's my teammate and he's been in this game three times. Yeah. You know, it's so valuable. And that's that's really the big thing we're missing at this moment. Yeah. It's just uh, you have Dez, who's the only returning player, and he played in a Sweet 16, but uh, nobody was even here to listen to the do what we do or, you know, all yeah, the different right. things that you could repeat yeah. in your sleep. So yeah. I think the time, you know, it just mm-hmm. it takes time to build. It takes time for an individual player to really become better and sure of himself, and uh, I think you're a testament to that. I appreciate that. Kenny, it's great to have you here. It's great to see you back around. Our first yeah. seven-footer. First seven-footer, yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. How about Hopefully that? not our last. Not our last. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, yeah. but it's been, it's awesome been great. Awesome to be here with yeah. you, Kenny, it's and always great, great, to, great to see you. And, uh, you know, your family always has a special place in the Miller's heart for all the good reasons so yeah, right. it's great great right. to great to have you on perfect that's kenny freeze you can find kenny uh in audio form if you want to hear more from him you can find him on the roll blob podcast you can follow us here on the sean miller podcast at sean miller pod on all social media platforms make sure you subscribe on youtube we're growing every day uh on youtube so make sure you subscribe there thanks again to our sponsors deer park roofing tge solar payroll partners everybody that helps make this show possible for kenny freeze coach miller 
Adam Baum. I'm Paul Fritchner signing off. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Sean Miller Podcast. This has been the Sean Miller Podcast, presented by Deer Park Roofing, with your hosts, Paul Fritchner and Adam Baum. Join us again soon for another episode with the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller.